All right. Well, welcome everyone uh, to Stroudwater's Critical Access Hospital Financial and Operational Virtual Conference. You know, folks are just trickling in now. Um, this is uh, Region B's uh, Critical Access Hospital Financial and Operational uh, Virtual Conference. So welcome all. Uh, we do have a few uh, slides to go over, just housekeeping um, slides. And this is really just um, meant for folks. Everyone is going to be muted as you come on. Um, if you'd like to ask questions or have any comments during today's uh, conference, please use the chat function. We will be monitoring that or the Q&A feature as well. Um, slides and recordings will be made available after the webinar today. Um, all sessions are being recorded as, as you enter here today. And also um, at the conclusion of today's conference, there is gonna be a short survey that goes out um, and your feedback is certainly very much appreciated if you take some time uh, to go through that at the end of today. Uh, so just a little bit about Stroudwater. Hey, we are a national consulting firm. Um, if you are not familiar with us, this just represents, you know, our, our kind of geographical reach um, and working with a lot of uh, clients. Uh, this is representing since 2017. We have been a firm for uh, 37 years and um, we're really um, kind of very much rooted and proud to serve our rural communities across the U.S. We also have Stroudwater Capital Partners. Uh, Stroudwater Capital Partners is a new subsidiary of Stroudwater Associates. You can see um, and learn more about Stroudwater Capital Partners at their website, but again, uh, serving our, our rural clients with a lot of uh, capital funding and support around the USDA funding uh, mechanism. So uh, lots for them to, to share and you can go and visit their website as well. So I'm sure you're all very excited. Um, today, uh, uh, we're gonna talk and get things started with a little bit about health equity um, and really around the importance of data collection. And I'm sure it's very kind of hot topic lately, lots of, you know, over the last several years, lots of, of chatter and discussion around health equity. And so um, I'm Lindsay Corcoran, Senior Consultant at Stroudwater, and I'm going to be sharing a little bit more about the importance around data collection today. So really, um, what I'd like to share is, you know, certainly as as rural hospitals um, across the country, you know, and being located in a rural kind of geographical area, we already know that we kind of face uh, disproportionate social and economic disparities um, compared to our urban counterparts. And really, it today is really the time to start to look at data. Um, if you're not already doing that, we're gonna we'll talk a little bit more about how to make that a little bit easier for you. What are some processes um, to implement and really um, just start to kind of leverage and, and understand what it means to collect meaningful data and analyze that data um, to really start to, to look at it from both a health equity and social determinants lens. Um, and, and really, how does this data support a, an overall health equity strategy? And we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. So why does health equity data matter? Well, you know, certainly, unless any type of particular data is, is measured, unless we, if, if we measure it, we're able to kind of understand where there may be disparities. Um, so oftentimes, if there is no measurement, there's no data collection, uh, those health care disparities really go unnoticed. Um, even as we start to say, oh, we're going to improve healthcare in this area, if we don't have the data and understand the data, how are we really going to be able to kind of understand the gap and, and find the solution? Um, looking at stratified healthcare data, and so it's really starting to differentiate between race, ethnicity, language, and other demographic factors. Um, is is vital for understanding and addressing health uh, health disparities. Um, organizations and a lot of organizations we really under uh, underestimate the magnitude of disparity um, in their own patient population or even just at the local level within the four walls of your hospital. Sometimes we 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 underestimate. We may think um, something that's going on in our community is is actually not happening, <laughs> or, or it may be different than what we are, or think, or we're unaware of some of the barriers that patients may, may face. So um, really looking and, and closely examine, 
examining stratified quality and health outcome data is really the most reliable way to understand what that magnitude is of disparity and how we can start to strategize and find some and uh, solutions or or initiatives um, allocate necessary resources to really start to close some of those gaps um, of of health disparities. As you may well be well aware that, you know, certainly CMS is all in as it relates to health equity. Um, they have come out with a hospital commitment to health equity measure. So as a this is a, a PPS rural uh, quality measure uh, through the um, inpatient quality reporting program, but not to say, as I know, I have a room full of critical access hospitals. Critical access hospitals should certainly be aware of, of this report quality reporting measure. Um, there has been talk that this could be something or something similar um, in the MBQIP program. So again, um, really utilizing and, and looking at this particular health equity measure um, can really go a long way for a, a rural hospital um, because it really captures five different domains here um, and really assesses a hospital's commitment to establishing a culture of equity. And it starts off around strategic planning, there's data collection, data analysis, quality improvement and leadership engagement. In addition to that commitment to um, health equity measure, there's also a, a two other measures really around capturing and screening um, social re health related social needs. So the social determinants of health and um, and and making you know finding solutions or connecting um, if you have screened positive for those uh, health related social needs that you know the organization takes the next step to doing that. So you know lots of different measures uh, from CMS that have come out in regards to this. Again, as a critical access hospital, we're not held accountable for this right now, but it is something that we should certainly not turn turn away from. When we look at um, the two domains of that CMS um, inpatient quality reporting measure, we look at the domain number two, and that was around data collection. So, you know, today's conversation is really around the importance of data collection. And from CMS's standpoint, and what they want um, hospitals to attest to is that, you know, a, a hospital collects, you know, demographic data. Um, and also as it relates to self-reported race and ethnicity or other social determinants of health information um, for the majority of the patients. So they want to see hospitals doing that, collecting um, uh, demographic information. The hospital also has to commit to training for staff um, on, on how they collect that data. And we'll go in a little bit more about the importance really around that. Um, and so having a cultural sensitive collection of, of demographic data um, is vitally important here. And they expect you know, hospitals to be having that necessary training and support um, in that data collection for their staff. And then the hospital inputs demographic data or social determinants of health information into um, an EHR. So we need to, it's not you know, uh, collected by paper. It is something that when we do, we have inputted it into our EHR or our medical record. And you know, at the back end, when we move to domain three around data analysis, it's something that we can pull and really start to analyze and understand um, through stratification um, uh, you know, where some of those health-related social needs are, where we are, where are some gaps, where are some of those disparities. Domain number three of the uh, CMS uh, hospital's commitment to uh, health equity uh, domain is around data analysis. So as I mentioned, um, so is your hospital looking at st or stratifying uh, some of that demographic or social determinants of health data, uh, really to look at where those gaps are and, and look at, you know, including that. Um, and again, I think this is so important because when we measure it and we stratify it, we want to they're asking us to put it on a hospital performance dashboard. So we're putting it very much front and center to our organization. We're constantly keeping an eye on that, on those measures and seeing if any of our initiatives or our program activities that support closing those gaps um, is, actually, is, is actually working or, is, or we're moving in the direction in which we um, hope to achieve. 
So um, when we're doing these, you know, data collection, data analysis, and we're doing this in concert with the other three domains, we're really starting to advance an organization's commitment to health equity. If you are a um, organization that is uh, joint, uh, joint commission accredited, uh, they have, uh, you know, effective January 1st, 2023, they have also added, you know, um, requirements for their elements of performance, their standards around reducing healthcare disparities. So you can see, you know, lots related to screening of patients for social determinants of health needs, um, you know, identifying health disparities by stratifying uh, quality and safety data. So again, in, in parts of data collection and data analysis are vital in, in a main components of the elements of performance um, as, as the Joint Commission sees it. So again, um, lots of, of kind of key federal accreditation groups that are really highlighting uh, the importance around health equity and really uh, developing performance standards or expectations on organizations as we move to advance health equity. Um, I believe the Joint Commission also has an accreditation um, program too, so we, your hospital can get accredited in, in achieving um, you know, high standards related just specifically to health equity. So if you are a Joint Commission hospital, um, might be something to, to also consider. So how do we use health equity um, data to really start to get to um, really relate it to our own community and community health? Well, looking at um, the importance of health related data, looking at um, health disparities in our communities is really uh, essential for filling the triple aim. So IHI's triple aim is all around, you know, uh, improving the patient experience, uh, improving the health of our populations and reducing the cost of healthcare. Um, when we, when we, when health hospitals and health systems, you know, identify disparities, they do that by querying the data. They are asking the data um, different questions. Maybe we want to uh, look at a Hispanic population with heart disease or um, high school education attainment and diabetes management or the level of those. Um, in, and another thing we, we start to look at when we look at um, health related data is when we look at it from a mapping or a visual, visualization. So we can certainly look at data very flat. You know, we see the numbers, we see them increasing, we see percentages. But when we take it to another level and we have the ability to maybe map the data or show them in, in a more kind of visual representation of the data, we can really start to understand where there may be uh, populations and where they are from a geographic standpoint that may be um, at an additional risk or may have a higher percentage of a certain um, healthcare disparity. So certainly uh, something to, to keep in mind if we have that uh, capability and those resources to start to kind of map the data, it really tells a, a, a better better story um, when we visualize it in that regard. But certainly we have barriers as it relates to uh, data collection and use. Uh, I, I know that I hear this from a lot of folks is that, you know, yes, we know data collection and data analysis is very important, but we, we lack uh, a, you know, the resources or the IT infrastructure, so maybe your EHR, for instance, that really creates this barrier for us to pull information out of or have the ability to um, analyze the data or stratify the data. So again, um, certainly there's lots of barriers that exist out, of, out, out there. Um, we have uh, patient privacy concerns. Uh, you know, we have folks that, you know, we ask for this information, um, for them to share around race, ethnicity, and, and, and other um, uh, kind of characteristics. And, you know, they certainly, they may not have a level of trust with a healthcare organization um, to be able to kind of share that information. Or maybe we haven't articulated um, that to our patient population about how this data is going to be used or why we are collecting this. Um, and then rural, you know, being in a rural community, we have small numbers. Um, if you look at your population uh, and you start to even just kind of 
start to break down that population by race categories or ethnicity, you start to see maybe smaller numbers. Uh, and so having, you know, st statistically, um, um, you know, a, a, a percentage of the population that is, um, you know, you that you're able to utilize or analyze, you know, certainly um, is very, it can be a barrier. And then we're often seeing also that smaller numbers in some of our data sets are actually being suppressed. So how are you expected to kind of compare your organization with maybe another county or a zip code level uh, data? And there is no data because the numbers are so small that they are being suppressed. So again, uh, barrier in, in terms of the data collection and use as it relates to just being in rural. And I'm sure, you know, if I told you all, I'm sure that you all would be able to come up with, a, you know, lots of, um, you know, barriers that you're experiencing at your own organizations that really uh, impact how you are able to kind of collect the data and analyze the data as well. So what we like to um, share are some, you know, when we're, we're going to implement data collection in our organization, it's it's really um, important to think about maybe implementing a data collection framework. So it's really a kind of a systematic structure in how we collect demographic data from our patients or our caregivers. And having um, a uniform framework really helps to capture more accurate and complete data sets, which is going to be very helpful when we go to stratifying and analyzing the data um, that we collect. So the American Hospital Association's Institute for Diversity and Inclusion um, has laid out a uniform framework. And really the framework includes um, adding in information around why the patient is being asked uh, to provide this information. So if you think about you know, your folks that do intake or admissions, um, do they, have they been coached or, or um, uh, shared with on why we collect some of this information uh, for our, of our patients, um, having a script for the staff to use. So each time um, they can have, uh, if they're, that they, they can really support them in that data collection, um, making sure that it is a standard standardized or uniform um, approach to data collection. And then really, um, do you all have a method for allowing patients to self-report? because maybe they don't want to kind of uh, report um, some type of patient-related um, information, their healthcare data uh, to, to the person asking the question. Maybe there's some privacy concerns, as we just mentioned. Is there an, a way that they can self-report that information, uh, maybe electronically or, or something in that regard? Um, do we have um, assurances that the data is gonna be held confidentially? You know, certainly something uh, very important for folks as they share health-related uh, information with you, with you, um, especially when we're asking for maybe some information that they've not necessarily shared with folks as they enter into the healthcare system or or um, at a medical provider's office. Um, and then also, when we move into, we we really want to start to have a standardized approach for how we um, kind of look at the rolling up the granular, granular responses. So, um, and, and this will really help when we do reporting and the analysis. And so we look at it from the, you know, race, American Indian, Alaskan Native, um, and then different ethnicities, uh, Hispanic or Latino or not Hispanic. So how do we kind of that standardized approach about rolling up the data? And then, Certainly when we get to move in from the data collection, we need to really develop a strong data infrastructure um, around the analytics part. And so having um, leadership support um, is, is really essential for organizations to really start to move into, uh, you know, health uh, data um, analytics. And a lot of organizations are um, starting to really, you know, put that as a, str a strategic focus for the, the organization and really making some investments in resources around data analytics. Um, so, you know, there's new positions that are coming out. Um, there are, are folks that 
are specializing in data analytics and population health. And so again, organizations are really starting to make those investments and in necessary resources because it is so important um, to, to be able to, if we're gonna be starting to move in this direction around identifying health disparities and developing strategies to close some of these gaps, we really need to be good um, and have a firm kind of foundation on the analytics part of it. Um, having, providing staff and in, in training um, and support for um, obtaining that accurate data. You know, the, I hate to mention this, but you know, the garbage in, garbage out. If we cannot get, you know, complete accurate um, data sets, how are we really going to be able to have the output uh, you know, be strong and really paint the picture and tell a story. Um, having a, a way in which we assess the accuracy of our data, uh, certainly, you know, whether it's um, validation of sampling, where we, you know, uh, select a sample of patients that we maybe um, interview and we, we validate what we've collected with those through those interviews, or maybe we observe patients. Um, how well do patients understand what's being asked to them as it relates to kind of data collection? Um, and, or we observe our staff. How, how well do our staff present um, the request for patients in that uh, health-related data. Um, so again, ways that we can start to maybe um, assess the accuracy of our data in the data collection that we're using. Um, and then, you know, looking at characterizing the missing data. So obviously we will likely have gaps or holes um, within our data. And so sometimes for organizations that may have a low number of uh, um, missing data, they just might, you know, just eliminate that, that data. Um, but if you have, you know, a high rate of, of missing data in your data sets, you know, certainly that's going to impact the, uh, validity, um, and the analysis of that data. So really we need to make sure that we, we close those gaps as it relates to some of the missing data. And then lastly is, is really around um, the reasons why we stratify the data um, and, and really making sure that we articulate to our staff the reasons for um, stratifying or, or differentiating the data. Um, we really wanna identify where inequities exist um, and then understand the demographics of the communities in which we serve for our organization. So what are some different data sets? Well, certainly we have internal data sets um, and, and that might be you know, our clinical outcomes, the information that we're collecting around social determinants of health. We have referral information, we have utilization information. We have lots of data um, internally as, as a healthcare provider. And then we have access to different external data sites. We may have health information exchanges depending on your state. We have state and federal uh, data sets. We have information that even might be much local to your county, um, and you might have local county level data. Um, claims data, if you're in, you know, maybe you're in an ACO and you can get claims level data. Um, these, these data um, uh, sets exist. What we always say is utilize the data that you have and get the data that you need. Start to um, assess where you are today from your internal data set. And if you need to compare or bring in additional data sets, uh, do certainly be able to do that. And you can just see here, you know, where we have, if we bring in data from primary care and data from outside of primary care uh, sources, you know, we start to be able to understand um, and uh, what, where are those gaps, stratify the risks, start to engage our patients, manage their care, measure the outcomes, and at the top, understand the population. And, you know, really that's the goal um, as we look at bringing in different data sources and looking at health-related data. So um, there's also um, ICD-10, and likely you have um, started to use or are using, I hope you are, um, the different Z codes. And the Z codes are really around uh, the social determinants of health data. Um, so, you know, really making sure that we are capturing 
um, the social determinants of health Z codes, not only for ourselves in, in, in our organizations at the local level, but again, if we are, are coding these, um, they are going to our payer sources. They are going to Medicare, for instance, where we're now we're at the federal level. The federal level uses this information and they, again, start to um, look at this information, this data, understand um, what's going on from a local level as it relates to social determinants of health. So, you know, we can, um, there's, there's grant opportunities, there's funding mechanisms um, that come out because of the use of data. So it's so important to be looking at this from a local level and the impact that it may have on more of a, a global federal level as well. So just keep that in mind. And then, you know, certainly um, looking at asking your data the right questions. Um, and, you know, it really will help give insights into the social determinants of health of patients in your hospitals um, or, or your community. And so there's different kind of ways in which we query or we ask the questions. It might be a process query. Um, so around kind of treatment, procedure, encounter, we may ask around what is the percentage of male patients who had a colonoscopy by ethnicity? or the percentage of patients with chronic health conditions who fill prescriptions, we may look at it at a zip code level. Um, and then on the other side, we have outcome um, examples. And some of those outcome query questions that we're asking our data, maybe we wanna see the ethnicity breakdown of patients who suffered a fall during an inpatient stay, or the breakdown of Hispanic patients hospitalized by COVID um, by English speaking and non-English speaking. Again, getting really granular um, with our queries and our um, how we question and ask the data um, our, our questions and what we want to find out. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, kind of rolling it all up around kind of the data collection and the data analysis. Um, when we identify and understand health equities, what we always like to make sure that we don't always rely on assumptions um, and hence why data collection and data kind of analysis and interpretation is so, so important because health equities in our communities may differ from what's presented nationally or even at the state level. Um, or even in surrounding communities. Think about your own community organization and you may have, uh, you know, different um, uh, demographics or kind of sub geography within your, your community that are, are vastly different than maybe at the state or county level. So again, um, don't, don't ro rely on, on, on those assumptions. Um, so utilize, you know, certainly the best available that's data uh, available. So whether that's internal data or, or state data, you know, seeing what is most is readily available and is the best um, data available to understand really what's happening within your community. Um, and then really, you know, gain a comprehensive understanding of the identified health inequities. Uh, examine multiple um, aspects of the health in your community. So, you know, certainly, you know, looking at identifying health risk behaviors and diseases, outcomes, um, and looking at it from, you know, of, of looking at it from income levels and demographics and geography and um, different environments and the social determinants of health, you know, having multiple aspects of looking at the data and collecting the data will really help um, uh, really kind of paint that picture of, of what's going on in your community. Leverage appropriate tools. Um, lots of different tools that are out there and you know, lots of um, databases, national databases, leveraging your health department, um, you know, universities and um, other maybe health systems um, and hospitals are, are great sources to finding local um, data on health. And if you um, want to drop in the chat some of the resources or the tools that you all use um, to help uh, identify health inequities or um, health related gaps, uh, certainly uh, do so and, and be able to share that with, with other folks on the line. 
Um, also partnering with uh, different organizations in your community to really support kind of data collection, maybe some of the outside of the healthcare space, uh, public works, transportation, police departments, they also have access to data sources in their, um, their organization. So certainly something um, to consider as you are, are kind of looking at ways to advance health equity in your organization. Um, and then really engaging in community members, not only from a data collection standpoint and interpretation standpoint, but you know, even just engaging that with them on the program activities or the initiatives as you advance health equity in your organization. Um, but even, you know, a lot of times uh, the hospitals will say, well, we don't have the resources, we don't have the staff, we don't have the time to be able to really um, collect information and interpret our, our data. Well, again, engaging community members to do that, providing training to community members to really help them participate in data collection activities. Maybe it is around um, walking audits, or maybe it is around um, community asset mapping and understanding where there's uh, reliable resources. Um, it certainly is something that you can perhaps leverage if you are con resource constraints. And certainly, you know, what gets measured gets improved. Um, a, a real key focus um, as we talk about data collection and analysis. So rolling this all up really um, is, is how we can leverage the data collection and the importance of data collection in our health equity strategy. And as I'd like to share with folks is health equity is certainly a journey. Um, and so organizations are really at all different levels, all different areas as it relates to health equity. It's certainly a journey. Um, the American Hospital Association created this continuum um, where healthcare organizations can be really anywhere across this continuum. Um, they, you know, folks can be all the way to transforming um, their, their healthcare within their community, or they might just be at the stage of exploring where they're really just trying to understand what do we have internally to be able to commit to this healthcare journey. So it's, it's very um, wide ranging and, you know, depending on your organization, certainly we're all in this, this health equity journey together. So, um, but some things to think about as you start to uh, think about your healthcare equity strategy, um, along with social determinants of health, is around um, data collection. So certainly, can we expand data collection at all um, points of care? Are we making sure that we're collecting data when a patient comes in uh, to register for uh, their first time as an office visit? Are we doing the data collection on admission? And, and again, making sure that we examine that stratified um, data and, and really start to understand the magnitude of disparity how do we allocate those resources accordingly um, by really understanding what that data is telling us as well? Um, can we incorporate health equity and outcomes data into conversations with key members of our, our staff, with our community, with our, our medical community and our board? Um, they need to understand the health related um, data that's coming, that is speaking to our community. Um, into our patients within that access healthcare services at our hospitals. Um, import, include data in strategic planning in your community health deeds assessment, um, and really start to explore the infrastructure enhancements to support kind of care management. Um, uh, we talked about the resources around data analytics, but then do you have care navigators, health coaches, um, folks that can start to really support care management in our organizations, leveraging technology, uh, certainly utilize technology or EHR as an asset, um, whether it's improving care coordination, but also collecting, um, you know, clinical and health related data um, into, into our EHR and making sure that we utilize that as our cl uh, data collection resource there. Sharing information, and again, collaborating with community organizations um, really is at, at the focus on how we are able to address and support the, the vulnerable populations that exist within our community. So really, you know, developing this health equity strategy 
is very all encompassing, um, but really starting to identify the, the gaps, the disparities, using data to be able to, to tell us or to show us where our focus should, should go um, is going to be different for every organization. So there is no one size fits all model, but again, utilizing the data and, and asking the data the questions will be able to, to get you all started um, as it relates to this health equity journey. So really in conclusion, um, you know, certainly the movement to talking about health equity was really pushed um, by COVID and really brought public awareness around um, the racial and ethnic, ethnic disparities around in health and healthcare. Um, and certainly this is something that's is vital and very important to the healthcare system. And but if we don't measure it, if we don't stratify the information, um, we really won't know what disparities exist and where we can um, really start to close some of those gaps. So leave with that um, and have some time for any questions before we go on to our, our next um, pr presenter. Great. Well, um, I will, again, you can use the chat uh, function or you can use the Q&A function. All right. Well, I am, as, as we are transitioning, I'm going to end my slideshow here um, and start to uh, introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is John Downs, um, and he's going to talk a little bit more about strategic facilities um, and planning. So, uh, John Downs, welcome. Awesome. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me, Lindsay? Yes. Looks great. Fantastic. All right. Then technology has, has been our friend so far this morning. Uh, excellent. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Uh, great presentation. Uh, and I think that, you know, in some ways, the the idea of health equity and kind of looking at that and measuring that really starts to move us into, you know, what is the organizational strategy and how do we begin thinking about taking some of those strategies and thinking about our facility needs through those same lenses. Uh, so, you know, great, great way to tee up this conversation. Uh, I've got 487 slides that we're going to go through in the next 40 minutes. I'm just kidding. Uh, but as any good consultant, I do have a slide deck to go through. Uh, and obviously, uh, just as in previous uh, sessions, feel free to shoot any questions to the chat box uh, or the Q&A. Uh, and we've got some folks on our side that are moderating that, and they'll be able to get those questions read out uh, to me. That way, I'm not reading them simultaneously with trying to present to you all. Uh, but so uh, my name is John Downs. I'm a principal at Stroudwater, and I've been here for just about 14 years. Uh, before that, I was a principal inside of an architectural firm. I am not an architect by training. My undergrad was in psychology. I thought I was going to be a psychologist, and I thought the next best thing was trying to wrangle architects uh, in figuring out how to design healthcare spaces. So I was really the person that facilitated the conversation between the design team, the clinical side, and the administrative side uh, when I was working inside of the architectural firm. Joining Stroudwater, I've really focused a lot more on strategic planning, facility master planning, and really the underlying market dynamics that drive both of those two things. So if we think about today, uh, key questions that we'll go through, how do we even begin to think about planning for 30 years out? These buildings are going to be with us for a long period of time. Many of you are likely in buildings far older than 30 years. Um, so, you know, how do we start thinking about that planning when we don't know what the future is? Uh, we start by asking, where are we and where do we want to go? Try to understand a little bit about what's happening in our market from a math perspective, understanding the actual demand for services. Uh, what do we need in order to meet those demands? And what can we afford? You know, those two things are often very much in conflict, uh, particularly in smaller rural facilities. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how I would recommend one go about facility planning. What kind of a team do you look at? 
what is an approach that we found to be successful in doing that? And what are some of the critical elements to make sure that we're doing that right? And then finally, and really we kind of begin with this, is how do we enable financing? It doesn't do us any good to go through a facility master planning project process and realize at the end, oh, well, we can only afford paint and wallpaper. We can't actually afford to do the things that we've now gotten everyone really excited about doing. So we really start with some of that upfront to understand what is our capacity, and then we know that we're moving towards an eventual goal. So it starts by understanding where you are, the capital capacity, what can we afford to do? What's the area that we're providing care for? How are demographics changing? What's happening with underlying utilization? What are our competitors doing? And what do we have today? What are our existing assets that sit there in the marketplace? So the first piece, you know, I can't stress it enough before you get into a facility master planning engagement is to at least have a baseline understanding of what our capital capacity is. That does not mean that we need to go do exam level feasibility studies upfront to figure out those types of things, but we certainly want to have a sense as to where we've been historically, uh, what sources of capital are available. Do we just have you know, a whole bunch of cash uh, that we can spend, or we've got very wealthy donors that are going to help us, or might we need to go out and look at other organizations for some of that capital, whether that's USDA financing, it is bond financing, it's partner financing, where the smaller fish of a bigger family and perhaps our large partner is able to help us with some of that capital. We also need to understand where we are today because it's gotta be realistic. So oftentimes when we're eventually getting into any kind of financial feasibility, we'll need to understand what the five-year trend of EBITDA is. Uh, what kind of cash do we have on hand? Some lending agencies, most lending agencies are going to want to make sure that we've got enough cash to be able to pay our bills. And that really goes into that debt service coverage ratio. In terms of the free cash we have at the end of the year, are we able to make the payments on that debt? Uh, and do we have existing debt? Is that something that we want to roll into a larger project so that there's only one borrowing? Are we even able to borrow anything more given the amount of additional debt that we, or the existing debt that we have? And also we want to make sure that we have some sense early on as to what our need for new capital is. And I'll talk about that in a bit and how we kind of start to quantify that but it's important to remember that it's not just facility things that cost money, right? EHRs cost money, recruiting providers cost money. All of those types of things can drain some of our capital. So we've got to think about not just what our facility needs for new capital might be, but what other things do we have coming down the pipe? So when we think about any kind of planning, whether it be, and I think this, I would argue that this could actually work for providers, just like it can work for, um, for facility types of things, there are four key levers of demand modeling. This doesn't matter if it's a small critical access hospital physician practice, or you know, I live outside of Boston, uh, Mass General, you know, large, super large hospital. We look at these four levers. It starts with the population that we're trying to serve. What's our service area? And I'll dig into that in a little bit. Once we understand our population, then we have to ask ourselves, what's the rate that people use services within that population? 100% of the market, right? So we think about that in terms of a utilization rate, the number of ED visits per thousand people in the population, the number of admissions per thousand people in the population. But it gets more granular still than that when we start looking at individual imaging modalities, individual surgical procedures, all of those things get rolled back up so that we can start to plan facilities around that. That really talks about 100% of the market. And you know, it'd be a great scenario if we didn't have any competition, but unfortunately we often do. Uh, and so we really think about what our share of the market is going to be. So if we take the population times the utilization rate gives us 100% of the market, we multiply that against our market share, either current or projected. And that gives us a sense as to what piece of the market are we looking to cover for that particular service. Sometimes, particularly in rural communities, we may not offer everything. We should not offer anything, everything. Uh, I've been with clients that have said, oh, well, we should probably think about opening a cath lab. And this is not to say that, you know, no critical access hospitals should have cath labs. Many do, or maybe not many, some do, 
but certainly as we think about services that require either greater populations, greater amounts of capital expenditure in order to get those up and running, and the importance to make sure that we're maintaining kind of a safe volume uh, to keep our competencies up, uh, we may decide that we're not going to offer something. So we take a zero market share in that. But for the things that we do offer, we want to understand what our share of that might be. Now, our competitors have something to say about that. Our insurance companies today have something to say about that also as they begin to steer folks to potentially less costly sites of care, uh, particularly as we think about some diagnostic imaging uh, and some of the minor procedures, GI services and the such. Uh, also, our alignment and affiliation strategies. Is there an opportunity to make sure that our primary care providers are referring all the things we can do into our organization? And then as we think about things that perhaps we don't do, is there an opportunity for us to send those off to a larger affiliate uh, so that we can make sure that we're maintaining kind of a continuity of care, but also making sure that we're kind of the, the key holder in terms of where those things are going. The final lever is really the throughput side. That's how fast can we put something through our given system. So if I'm in an emergency room and the average length of stay in the emergency room is three hours, I'll need a certain number of ED treatment spaces. If the average length of stay is an hour, I'm going to need fewer treatment spaces. It's just one of those things that we start to look at, how long does it take to get through? What are our hours of operation? Do we have half day on Saturday for our ORs, for our diagnostic imaging, so that we can spread the volume out over larger periods of time, thus perhaps needing a little bit less in terms of facility response to that. So when we think about the population, it's really talking about what's our service area. And we have to ask ourselves, what's our real service area? I just did pro a project for a client in the Northeast that was using an old service area map uh, from uh, the Dartmouth Atlas. You know, that was how they were defining their entire state. They divided the state up based on how the Dartmouth Atlas did that, but that wasn't reflective of reality. So we really had to think about what their real service area was. Sometimes that's a county or a district or a hospital defined service area. Inside of the service area though, we have to ask, are we the dominant provider for anything? Maybe not inpatient. Are we the dominant ED provider in a given community? If we're not, should we be because it's so close to us or is it really not part of our service area and instead we should be looking at uh, that being perhaps in a secondary service area or tertiary service area uh, that really gets into how we think about dividing the, the service area do we subdivide it into smaller pieces so that we can think about them independently it's really important if we do that though that we have non-overlapping service areas I don't want to think about, yes, I'm going to get 55% of the market in this zip code, but that same zip code is in someone else's service area and they think they're getting 55%. How do we make sure that we're looking at that correctly? Finally, who does the project benefit? As we think about perhaps reaching out to some of our further communities, uh, even if they're anchored by a rural critical access hospital, do we think about expanding our service area, offering a clinic in a community that perhaps was underserved in the past? Once we understand that service area, then it's really about the demographics. Understand what our population is today and what's projected to happen in the future. How is the age distribution going to impact our future? If we see a significant growth in the 65 plus age cohort, well, what does that mean? Number one, a lot of those folks are going to be Medicare, so relative to critical access hospitals, that's a good thing for us. Um, but we're also going to have a different utilization profile when we think about an older population. Medicare folks use services three to five times as much as younger folks. And so we've got to think about how that impacts our eventual utilization. Special groups, do we have a university on campus that perhaps isn't counted, or not on campus, but nearby, that isn't counted as part of our core population, but we provide services to them. Do we have a prison? And we've got to think about those special populations. What's happening relative to the underlying market dynamics? Do we see people leaving the community? Do we have new housing starts? All of those types of things. And then finally, and it really goes to that the conversation that Lindsay started earlier, how do we make sure that when we're looking at our demand inside of a market, we're looking at it not just through what's happened in the past, but through a lens of health equity to say, perhaps we weren't catching things we should have 
We weren't reaching the people we should have in the past, and we may want to do that in a different way going forward. Once we understand the population, then we can think about the utilization of services. What is our existing volume in the market today that we're controlling? Do we have a sense as to the overall volumes inside of the market? And you know, typically at Stroudwater, we're using a proprietary database by Meritive. It used to be IBM Watson. Before that, it was Truven. Before that, it was somebody else. Uh, but really looking at zip code specific, not it's not the same in Boston as it is in rural Mississippi, as it is in New Hampshire. It's very, very different. So we want to think about it at a localized level. What's the overall market look like? What's happening from an inpatient to outpatient transition? What do we see in terms of individual service lines? And then finally, that market share piece, how much of it am I controlling today? How much of it might I want to control in the future? Well, I mentioned before, competition is key when we think about what it is that we're doing versus what someone else might want to do. And it's not just hospitals that we're competing with these days. It's not even just hospitals and provider groups. It's the retail marketplace also. We're seeing more and more come in either bricks and mortar coming in, excuse me, to our Walgreens and our Walmarts and our CVSs, or is it virtual that's also being offered in the retail marketplace? And how does that impact what we might need to provide from a facility perspective in the future? <clears throat> we also want to understand what and where our existing assets are. So, you know, the main hospital campus, great. We know where that is. That's gonna be where our beds are. Maybe we've got a nursing home there. We've also got some ambulatory services. We've got ancillaries. We've got all the support infrastructure that we need to do our main hospital duties. But then what about offsite locations? And really trying to balance the efficiency of having everything in one spot from a main hospital campus perspective to the um, kind of community connection of having things distributed, perhaps more patient centered out in some offsite locations, whether that be just a practice, just a part-time practice, or is it a practice that does blood draw? Is it a practice that does blood draw and point of care uh, testing? Is it a practice that has some minor imaging? Do we start to grow and grow and grow as those practices, as those offsite locations get a little bit larger? Again, when we make those decisions about where we might have something today versus in the future, it starts to change perhaps what we would have to plan for on our main hospital campus. We then want to think a little bit about strategy. And I mentioned before, you know, how do we make a facility plan that needs to kind of live with us for the next 30 years? Well, none of us really know what that future is going to be. So it's about thinking through those underlying market dynamics we just talked about, setting your strategic vision, understand here's the target that we'd like to get to, here are the things we have to do, the tactics we have to implement via our strategic plan in order to get there. And then if we're successful, here's what we're going to need from a facility perspective. So it's really thinking of both a strategic planning opportunity as well as a facility master planning opportunity. Remember the key in saying the word planning does not commit us to do something. Facility master plan is not facility project. It's a plan for the long-term. Projects come out of that plan as long as they're moving towards an eventual goal. So we also have to think about what's happening inside of the market, some of the changes that we're seeing, not just today, but as we project things out into the future. Will we continue to see a shift from inpatient to outpatient care? I think it's you know, relatively apparent in most of our markets that we've seen perhaps a little bit of a bump post COVID in terms of inpatient utilization, perhaps because folks weren't necessarily getting the care that they needed to get during COVID. So they put things aside and now we're kind of paying the price for that. But we're also continuing to see kind of continued over, over time, continued declines in inpatient utilization really throughout most of the country. Uh, that then drives an increase in observation stays because we're just shifting the patient from an inpatient to an OBS uh, stay, but also things that can start to be delivered at home, delivered virtually. Uh, understanding long-term changes in market share. Do we have our existing competition kind of understood and we're going to be successful in that, but what are we thinking about relative to new entrants and how will that start driving what some of our facility requirements might be? When we think about that strategic vision, it's also a time for us to say, is there a new geographic area we want to be pushing into? 
are there new service lines? I just worked with a, a client in a rural community that did not offer mammography on campus. And so, you know, yes, there are absolutely challenges with making sure that we've got, you know, providers that are able to read that, we've got equipment, we've got all these other things, but mammography itself is a relatively low cost facility investment. It is a low amount of square footage in terms of facility investment. And I would argue it is a core service for any rural hospital to be providing. So how do we think about that, if not today, moving into that sometime into the future? We can start thinking through, do we add additional providers in our market? What is the facility response to that? What might our future volumes be? And do we have particular financial objectives that we need to be able to meet in order to execute on some of our visions? So transitioning now into thinking about the facility master planning process itself, and really it's, you know, it's a comprehensive process, but it starts by involving multidisciplinary stakeholders, right? It's making sure, and I'll talk a little bit about who uh, in a few slides, but it's making sure that we've got folks at the table early on in the process, and it doesn't have to be a long drawn out process. I mean, we've done uh, facility master planning uh, where the entire engagement is a week long intensive process so that you can get the right people there, get their opinions, explain the underlying data, make decisions and move on. You know, oftentimes it is not the cost of a master planning engagement that becomes problematic. It's the time cost of gathering all of the folks on the hospital side that makes it more challenging. So really looking at how do we get that into a multiple multidisciplinary group, but do it in a rapid way. We want to identify financial facility priorities and financial abilities. First thing we do when we get on campus is, well, what's the big issue that you've got here? And it's, well, my roof is leaking or my emergency department is too small or this or this or this. Okay, great. Let's put a pin in that. Let's understand that's one of the big things that needs to be addressed. But we also don't want to do that at the expense of the long-term viability of an organization. So we also understand the financial abilities there. We want to understand the market needs today and the future. We talked a lot about that on the previous slides, making sure that we're not just designing a building for what someone said in an architectural magazine two years ago was the ideal building. We want to understand the market needs for us today and in the future, and how does that look from a facility response? We then start to evaluate short and long-term options. Remember that initial facility priority, we have to fix the emergency department, this thing is leaking. That becomes the short-term priority. But how do we make sure that that fits into a long-term option? We then fast track immediate projects. If we know, for example, you know, yeah, the beds are a problem and we're gonna have to do something about that. But our number one issue is that we want to consolidate our clinics on the main campus. Okay, great. How do we begin to consolidate those clinics? Let's fast track that as long as it fits into that long-term uh, option we develop that long range facility framework, but make sure that it's got phased opportunities so that, you know, oftentimes, you know, especially nowadays, and we'll talk about the cost of construction uh, and interest rates uh, in a couple of slides, but, you know, just rough number, I'll scare everyone. You know, if you're having your breakfast at the, mo at the moment still, you, know, you might spit it out, but we're looking at like a thousand dollars a square foot to build and, you know, to build with equipment and all of those types of things on a hospital campus in a rural community. I'm not talking about, you know, island communities. I'm not talking about in the middle of, you know, downtown New York City. We're talking about baseline construction, middle of America, $1,000 a square foot for hospital construction. Um, most folks can't afford a full replacement at that point. Um, so we instead have to look at how do we start to phase things so that we're not throwing good money after bad and we're not doing anything that prevents us to get to our eventual goal. Finally, the finance side. Make sure that as we're doing a master plan, particularly as a critical access hospital, we're building out a pro forma financial model that includes the Medicare cost report impact. You know, as critical access hospitals, we have certain advantages that other PPS hospitals do not have relative to how we're able to get our funding uh, put together uh, so that we can afford some of these facility investments. If I was not getting cost-based reimbursement for a portion of my volume, it is unlikely that I could afford to do 
a large facility investment unless I had some of the other really, really large uh, kind of uh, revenue centers. You know, I, now I'm going to put the cath lab in. I'm going to ma have massive amounts of orthopedic surgery. I'm going to make sure I have an MRI. All of these things that in the you know, 90s, 2000s, that was part of the medical arms race. Everybody wanted to do those things so that you could afford to do other things. In critical access hospitals, given the impact of cost-based reimbursement, we have a little bit more of an opportunity to think about right-sizing the true need for the organization and the government can help us to pay for that. So those broad perspectives, it is not just the senior management that sits around and says, this is what we need. It is also likely not the senior management and the medical staff to say this is what we need. It is a broad perspective. Senior management, medical staff, absolutely critical. The board and the community, though, is going to be really critical if we need to be going out for you know, donations, you know, we're trying to do a fundraising campaign, if we ever needed to do some type of a mill levy or any other type of a tax, that's something where the community is going to need to want to support what it is that we're doing. So if we can bring them into the master planning process early on, that can be positive. Departmental leadership, always critical. And then even the patient perspective, you know, and I say, I put them last, you know, but I'm assuming that all four of the first groups that we've talked about, senior management, medical staff, board, community, and de departmental leadership are thinking from a patient perspective. I also would love to be able to get the actual patient perspective, you know, and sometimes the board and community can bring that because they are also patients in the facility. But what is it like for wayfinding? What are the problems that you see when you arrive at the campus? You know, I, having been to so many hospitals, I can show up at a campus and understand what I think my issues are, but I've also been in lots of hospitals. So mine is going to be very different than someone that shows up the first time or has to show up every week for a particular procedure. So bringing that patient perspective in is really important. Another really, really critical thing, and if I could only have one slide for my entire slide deck, it would probably be this one. Uh, and it really just says, uh, be careful just scratching today's itch. Uh, all too often when we come up with that first issue, hey, I've got this problem on my, you know, on my campus, um, someone goes, oh, okay, well, I can solve that. You know, great, here's how you solve it. I'm going to put, you know, an ED expansion. I'm going to put a new clinic. I'm going to do whatever else it is on your campus without thinking about the rest of the campus. And so it's absolutely critical to have that long-term plan first before we plop a building down on our campus so that we can evolve over time. The example that I show on the right-hand side here, this was a client that was looking to consolidate two clinics into one space. Well, they wanted to do that on their campus. They weren't looking to move that out into another community because they already had some clinics out in another community, but they wanted to bring these two areas into one spot. Well, we could just put that in, but if I also wanted to expand my emergency department at some point, I wanted to do something with my diagnostic imaging, I really needed to think about how that could fit in this blue zone over here in the short term, even if I wasn't going to do it all right away. So we really want to think about long-term planning. We base that in the market, we understand what we have and what our needs are. And as we begin to make an investment or an actual project plan, we ask the question, what will today's project do to my future flexibility? You know, can I afford to wait? Is this something that I don't have to do today? And if the answer is you must do it today, then make sure that we understand it's not going to negatively impact my future, uh, my future flexibility. Uh, how can the cost report help? You know, we talked about kind of from a financing perspective. And another key piece is where must I not put a building? You know, if I think about a facility and says, well, I can't, re I can't afford to replace the entire thing today, but I would like to do this over time. You know, how do I make sure that I'm keeping the available spaces so that I can execute that over time? If I put a clinic where the eventual emergency department needs to go, or I put the emergency department in the only spot where beds might work, long term, then I've caused myself other problems. We have a client that we've worked with uh, needed to add some beds for a particular service line, and those were added in a different part of the campus than the rest of the beds. 
And you know, so now we've got two separate inpatient units, really challenging from an efficiency perspective, neither one in the ideal spot long-term. It's one of those things where if we go in and do a master plan, it's likely going to be, you need to get rid of those beds that you already invested in because that wasn't a good investment. So think through where must I not do something as well? Um, when we think about facility planning, adjacency considerations, really, really important. So, you know, we've got oftentimes kind of three key entrances. We've got an emergency entrance, and maybe that's separated between kind of ambulance and walk-in, but sometimes it's one door, but it's in the same area. Uh, we've got our main entrance, kind of front of the house. How do we get in for the majority of our services? And then kind of back of the house entrance support, those types of things. If we think about our hospitals, especially the smaller hospitals, the ED is often the epicenter because almost everything that we have also needs to touch the ED. So ED patients need to get diagnostic imaging and diagnostic imaging patients may need to get back to the ED. ED in beds, how do I admit someone? Do I have to go through a public lobby? We had a client um, that has since done a facility plan to rectify some of these things uh, where every time a patient needed a CT scan, they needed to leave the emergency department and roll through the main lobby of the hospital to get to diagnostic imaging. They had an x-ray in the ER, but they didn't have CT and they were doing a lot of CTs out of the ER. And so those folks rolled through him and through the main lobby, everybody checking in saw them. It's just not a good thing. Uh, we also wanna make sure that we're minimizing duplication. We can't afford it in our smaller rural communities. And that example of kind of the checking or going across the main lobby to go to the CT scan, we really wanna to try to eliminate as much cross traffic as we can. Uh, thinking instead, all right, is there an opportunity when I make an investment in the ED or diagnostic imaging to get those to butt up against each other such that I can have one CT scanner, but if I come in from the outpatient side, I check in, now I'm in the scanner room, I've not interacted with anyone else, I go back out the outpatient side, an ED patient comes in through a different entrance into that same scanner area. Once I'm on a stretcher, once I'm on the, on the uh, gantry, it is not the same as crossing in a public lobby. So we wanna try to eliminate it as much as possible, recognizing we can't do it entirely. Um, just walk through kind of a quick example uh, where we've done uh, some facility master planning. This was with a client. Uh, that said, hey, our ED is absolutely awful. I mean, these they had a couple of treatment spaces that were under 80 square feet. Uh, so think about an eight by 10 room, uh, some of the offices you may be sitting in right now, unless you're of course in old inpatient beds, which many of you might be uh, from an office perspective. Uh, but there were a bunch of ED treatment spaces that were 80 square foot rooms with doors on them. So think of how claustrophobic that is. It's not even a, a storage room. Um, and then others were just cubicle curtains between them. So we have no privacy. We had none of those types of things. These folks needed to expand the ED and they wanted to make sure they were improving the space and the flow of the ED and increasing the number of treatment rooms. So what they looked at was kind of a horizontal expansion into this black uh, hatched area <clears throat> or black dotted area. Um, and we said, well, that's, that's one way to do it certainly, uh, but there are some other constraints because we did a facility master plan for them that said, hey, how are we getting from the ED to our beds? Is this administrative space that sits over here the highest and best use of that particular location? Is there something else that we can do? The other key for these folks though, was that this was uh, in the midst of COVID, they wanted to be able to use some of their COVID funding to do this. And it was a use it or lose it prospect where they needed to spend by a certain date uh, in order to get this, get this funded using those dollars. And so we said, all right, let's figure out where the ED needs to go. How do we do that? And then once we've figured that out relative to the overall master plan, you hire an architect, they execute on that project and you go forward. So we fast-tracked the master plan process so that we could also understand the other long-term needs. So in this particular example, instead of going out horizontally in the black hatched area, we instead kind of went north to south, expanding the emergency department, and then looked at how we could eventually bring inpatient beds over to this side of the main public corridor. Historically, if you can see where I show infusion six, we were looking at some infusion space and a couple of flex beds, that's the existing inpatient unit. One, the rooms are very small. Uh, two, you needed to cross over a public corridor 
from the ED every time you're admitting someone to the inpatient side. So we wanted to see, could we avoid that long-term by bringing a future med surge unit that would then swing into some flex beds and then infusion space and the old uh, inpatient unit. So that's not something they were gonna do for 10 years, but had they done the emergency department out to the far side, they would have locked, they would have said, well, now we've got a brand new emergency department. We don't wanna throw that away, but we've now got ourselves locked into the fact that we're gonna cross a public corridor to get to our inpatient beds, or even if we were to do this particular scheme, but left administration, you would either be going through administration or you would put something else there that you would have to traverse in order to get to the inpatient side, things that we wanted to avoid. And that's why we did a master facility plan. This same client, again, their big thing was let's do our ED project with CARES funding. And so that shows kind of that number one uh, area in green, that's the ED project. There were also a couple of other things that were really important for them. The lab needed to be renovated, uh, hadn't been renovated in quite some time, and it was in a relatively good spot. So we said, okay, great, there's some extra shell space that's nearby. We take over that as available uh, in the short term to modify that flex space. They wanted to do something with their kitchen, again, not impacting the main clinical areas of the hospital, and they had a large nursing home that was kind of off to the left of this plan. Uh, so that kitchen needed to be where it is so that it could serve both the hospital and the nursing home. They were also restarting their surgery program and the location, given that it was almost exclusively outpatient surgery and GI services, could be separated out from the emergency department, could be separated out from the inpatient unit, although we would bring patients through this back corridor if needed to recover on the inpatient unit from that surgery area. Longer term though, again, not for 10 or more years, an opportunity to build those new inpatient beds, an opportunity to expand the clinic as needed. This was a client that had a very robust provider network, large clinic that was built in 2015, but you know, as the community was growing, there may be the opportunity or the need to expand that clinic. We wanted to make sure that we understood where that would go. That's what part of a master facility plan is. It's thinking about the where long-term. The other key in master facility planning is that it is the time for conservative budgeting, right? This is not the time, and I would say, if I could point out one of the biggest challenges that I see uh, in the market when we're doing master facility planning, uh, or when architects in particular are doing master facility planning is they will often tell you what you want to hear. You tell them you have a $30 million budget, they'll find you a $30 million project uh, until you hire them. And then you get down the line and you realize, oh, you wanted windows and you wanted a door and oh yeah, you wanted a roof. And then suddenly that 30 million became 35 or it became 40 or became whatever else it might be. The key at master planning level is don't underestimate. Construction costs per department square foot, I talked earlier that $1,000 uh, is kind of the total cost. So that'd be construction cost plus the soft cost. Um, but you have to remember when we're thinking about the amount of space required, it's not just the space inside the room. We've got corridors that have to connect those spaces. We've got exterior walls. We've got infrastructure, mechanical, electrical. If we've got elevators or stair towers, uh, we've got to deal with those things as well. The soft costs, furniture, fixtures, equipment, fees, administrative costs, having contingencies at a master planning level is really critical because there may be things that come up in detailed design that we really need to make sure we understand well, um, and then we can lower costs at that point. Until we understand them well, we've got to keep some of those contingencies in. And then finally, understanding what the impact on finance or of financing costs may be. You know, right now we're kind of hit with that double whammy of we've got high construction costs and high interest rates. Those two things coming together make a lot of folks kind of take pause or rethink their projects. Again, doing the plan doesn't require us to execute the project right away. It's often good to do the plan, even at times when the construction costs and interest costs are so high so that you're ready to act on them when those things do come back down. Um, making sure that everything we're doing is building realistic financing scenarios. 
uh, is also really, really important. I talked earlier, I think on the first or second slide of understanding the impact on the cost report. You know, that is something where critical access hospitals have an advantage in that, you know, again, we're making up for the low volumes by doing a cost-based reimbursement, but it enables us to get some of that construction cost, some of the long-term interest in those types of things paid for using our Medicare uh, dollars. Financial reserves, again, we don't want to spend it all, uh, but want to make sure that even after a project, we still remain viable. Uh, so we want to make sure that we've got adequate reserves to do that. Fundraising with a vision. You know, this kind of goes back to that uh, community and board interaction early on in the process. Uh, folks like to bet on the winning horse. Uh, folks don't often like to bet on the losing horse or on a horse that they're not sure is going to be able to come through. If we have a vision, it is often a lot easier for us to go to the community with that vision and get some funding or get some relief relative to you know taxes and things like that so that we can keep healthcare in the community. You know, it is really, really critical. I mean, how many rural hospitals have we seen close over the last several years? We don't want to see more of those go. I know at Stroudwater, you know, our passion is to make sure we're keeping care local and we're keeping hospitals open. And so making sure that we've got a viable, valid vision and then fundraise accordingly is going to be really important. And then finally, understanding that debt capacity, you know, we don't have the cash on hand, great. Do we have the ability to borrow that? And how much could we borrow? Let's not borrow up to the last penny that we're able to do. Uh, let's be realistic in terms of what that might look like. So capital planning, remember, it's not just the facility plan that has to be funded with capital. So we can go borrow a whole bunch of money, we can build a beautiful building, but there are other things. If we've not replaced the entire hospital, then we're gonna have ongoing expenditures for our older buildings. We still have kind of some CapEx that we're gonna have to be hold on, holding on to, and we can't just zero that out and say, oh, well, it will be nothing in the future financial model. Uh, equipment is going to need to be continuously replaced. Where are we with our electronic medical record? I mean, oftentimes, you know, if we're not partners with someone larger, uh, the EMR could dwarf the cost of any facility project uh, if we were trying to do that completely on our own. Uh, but making sure that we really have a good handle with our finance folks uh, around where does that money come from for all of our capital needs. Uh, when do we need to start that capital process? I mean, I think we wanted to start it early on so that we understood what our capacity was before we got too far down. Uh, you know, understand that you know we're going to eventually need to bring in some experts to do an exam level audited financial feasibility study. Uh, we're going to work with bankers to understand, are we going to use local banks? Are we going to do a program like USDA? We're gonna do a program like USDA. There are certain requirements that go into that as well uh, in terms of making sure that we're able to secure that financing from the USDA. You know, lower interest cost, but perhaps uh, more onerous requirements in order to get that. So if we think about bringing it all together, start from a strategic perspective, understand where you are and where you wanna go, uh, develop a long range plan, not an individual project plan. Project plans come out of having a long range facility plan and then make sure that everything enables that sustainable financial future. The last thing we wanna see is folks build newer facilities, make investments in facilities, but it ends up closing the hospital because they didn't have the wherewithal to be able to make that kind of an investment. So make sure that we're always thinking about that uh, from a sustainable perspective. Um, that is the end of my time. Uh, well, I've got two minutes left on my time uh, before I introduce my colleagues uh, for the next session, but any questions that I can answer now uh, or certainly uh, feel free to follow up with me. Uh, my email and my phone number are both listed here. Okay, uh, then I will uh, stop sharing my screen and I will uh, introduce my uh, next colleagues, uh, Jeff Summer and Claire Kelly. I see Claire uh, just popping on. Uh, they're going to walk us through some of the best practices that they've observed for understanding and quantifying strategic risk. Uh, so, you know, I think it actually, it ties really well into kind of some of the capital and facility needs 
and how do we make sure that that we're able to deal with those things uh, from a strategic perspective? And so, Claire and Jeff, I will stop speaking and kick it off to you. Great. Thanks so much, JD. I know Jeff is just getting on. So our presentation today is understanding and quantifying strategic risk, um, as JD so graciously introduced. So my name is Claire Kelly. I'm a senior consultant with Stroudwater. My colleague, Jeff Summer, is the managing director of Stroudwater, um, and he and I work in the kind of partnership and affiliation team, as well as the strategic options team. So today we'll we'll walk you through some of what our understanding of strategic risk is and how you as an organization can evaluate your strategic risk and why that's important and some strategies to mitigate that strategic risk. So to start, what are some industry factors that are impacting your risk? So we know that hospitals are closing across the country, specifically rural hospitals. So why is that happening? Why are we seeing these changes? What are the catalysts that are causing these changes? So one of the first things at Stroudwater that we tend to look at are the three most significant rating agencies in the world, and that's Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, or S&P. And they ever um, tw two times a year, they publish an outlook for what the rest of the year will look like. So their most recent one was done in Dece December 2022. And all three agencies said that for the nonprofit healthcare sector, that it was deteriorating or negative. Again, they will update that in another month or two. But some of the reasoning behind that negative outlook is that you've got labor shortages. So I don't think that'll come as a surprise to anyone that it's hard to retain staff, it's hard to get staff, it's hard to get providers. And you also have supply chain disruptions. A lot of that was driven by COVID and that supply chain is still kind of funky and messed, messed up. So it's adding to your expenses overall. And additionally, you still have some of these COVID-19 surges that are happening and you're not receiving the same funding in terms of COVID-19 relief funding that you were in the previous year. So that's all contributing to that negative and deteriorating outlook. We also are seeing a lot more consolidation across the industry. So from 2005 to 2020, you can see that there's been a lot more consolidation in affiliations. So in 2005 to 2010, you've got about, you know, number of affiliations is between 50 and 60 or number of transactions and partnerships. And then that's escalated to around 70 to 90 from, you know, 2015 to 2020. So there are a bunch of different key catalysts that are causing these transactions and affiliations. We could spend an hour presentation just going over those catalysts, but to touch on a few today, one of the big ones is margin pressures, right? You've got expenses that are outpacing revenues, so that's shrinking your margins. You have a staffing crisis, so not only are you having provider shortages, which are your MDs, your nurse practitioners, your physician assistants, you're having staffing shortages, not just your RNs, but your front desk staff, your facility staff. It's hard to get people in the door, especially at rural facilities. Additionally, economies of skill. And what we mean by economies of skill is knowledge. Rural healthcare is a really um, hard environment in terms of regulations. There are a lot of specific regulations that make it difficult to, to navigate and to understand where you can maximize your reimbursement and really get the most out of being a rural facility. So having the knowledge and the skill base to do that in your leadership, in your medical staff, in your board, that's an economies of skill scenario. And time is never a neutral factor. So this is a big saying at Stroudwater. And what we really mean by this is that it's really important to be efficient with your time. And when we say efficient with your time, it's efficient decision making. So don't rush through the decision making process. Properly evaluate the decisions you need to make as a firm um, and as an organization. Make sure you are aligned with your board, your leadership, your medical staff, that you're all in the same boat, rowing in the same direction. But when it comes to that time to make that decision, don't waffle back and forth and be able to say, OK, this is the direction that we want to go. If you're pursuing a performance improvement, you know, opportunities with your, your organization saying, okay, it's time to execute on these five initiatives. We need to go ahead and do it. The longer you wait and the more time that you debate about making the decision, the more at risk your organization can become just due to adverse events that are occurring in the market. For example, COVID-19, it's a really great example. People have been doing performance improvement projects and then COVID-19 hits and really just disrupts absolutely everything that's being done. 
An additional one, if you're searching for partners or if you're looking to have a partnership, the longer you kind of have to search for partners or the longer that 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 process takes, the more susceptible you are to market events. So we've had lawsuits that have come up, you know, when we're working with people in terms of partnerships. So it's better to just be extremely efficient with your time, do it and make decisions in an educated way, but make sure you're making efficient decisions. And then finally, understand the risk. The key here is that there's no risk-free option. So in this environment, whether you're pursuing an independent strategy and you want to be an independent hospital and you're doing performance improvement initiatives to improve your hospital, there are associated risks with that. There are operational risks that are associated with doing that. If you're looking to partner or looking for a further alignment strategy, no matter what kind of partnership that is, if it's clinical partnership, if it's a sole member substitution or a full asset merger, there are associated risks with that strategy as well. So it's really about understanding what the risks are with each strategy that you're looking to pursue and how you can mitigate those risks in the future. What are steps that you can take to make sure that those risks don't um, become the absolute barrier to you going forward and moving forward with your strategic vision and mission and plan for your organization? So let's talk about risk. When I say risk, what do I actually mean? How do we label an organization as risky? What does that mean? So typically we look at this continuum here of distressed to stable. And that's how we're evaluating if an organization is going to be high risk, medium risk, or low risk. So if you're a distressed organization, we probably label you as high risk. And a distressed organization is one that has three plus years of declining or negative margins. Um, they've had decreasing top line revenue. Um, you don't have sufficient reserves to fund your organization, to reinvest in your asset base, to do needed facility improvements, to do to purchase equipment that's needed. You are cost cutting on core services. So not just services that are needed in your community, but actually core services to the community you are having to cut. So that is what we would label as a distressed hospital. In terms of a stressed hospital, that would be one that has about two plus years of declining margins, flat top line revenue, you're not growing, um, you're reducing your needed services, so not core services, but needed services that you'd like to retain for your community. These are all signs of a, of a system that's stressed and heading towards a distressed organization. And finally, all the way to the right is a stable organization, and this is one that you know, has consistent margins, has, is retaining a solid market share in their area, and is growing type top line revenue, and is able to explore opportunities for reinvesting in its facilities and growing service lines and looking outside their community to continue to partner and grow service lines and, and really bring new services into their area. What we typically say is that if you're distressed or a stressed organization, it's time to think about your strategic future. It's time to evaluate your strategic risk and understand, okay, what are performance improvement initiatives that we can do to right the ship? What are ways that we can turn this around? Whether that's operational risks that you're going to assume in terms of doing performance improvement initiatives, or whether that's potentially pursuing a partnership. So why is understanding risk important? We've talked about how we would label an organization as distressed, stressed, or stable, and how that potentially relates to risk, but why does this really matter? And it matters because if you look at risk on an annual basis and then are able to look at the long-term trend, you can really evaluate your strategic position. And if you don't know where your strategic position is in the market, you are putting, you're endangering the sustainability the available resources to your facility and potential relationships that you have with your facility and other systems in the area. So if we see a high risk or a distressed organization, it really requires immediate performance improvement initiatives and potentially exploring partnerships. Immediate performance improvement initiatives are something that you would need to do right away. But the problem is, is that if you're two weeks away from not making payroll, there's limited performance improvement initiatives that are going to help you make payroll or generate cash in that time. Performance improvement initiatives take time. Getting back to that time is not a neutral factor. You need time to implement performance improvement initiatives effectively. So it's really important to evaluate your strategic position before you get to this distressed uh, position and high risk scenario. If you're looking to explore a partnership when you're distressed, 
there's no health system that wants to affiliate with a hospital that's about to close. So understanding that before you get to this distressed position, it's important to think about, oh gosh, are we going to want to affiliate in two years, but we're not going to be able to keep the doors open in two years. We need to really think about how that process is going to implement us and our sustainability moving forward. If you're an organization with medium risk or a stressed organization, this can potentially limit your strategic options in the future and jeopardize your mission over time. What we mean by that is if you have performance improvement initiatives that you want to initiate as a stressed organization, a lot of times those performance improvement initiatives, if done properly and implemented effectively and efficiently, can help slow or stop the deterioration of, of services and of your organization, but they're not going to stop it completely. So there's only so much you can do as a stressed organization, but it's important that you start that process as soon as possible so you can begin to right the ship. In terms of if you're a stressed organization that's looking to potentially partner, the longer you wait and the more stressed that you become as an organization, the less negotiating power you have. So that means less suitors that are going to be at the table to potentially be your partner because they see the stress that's going on in your organization. And it potentially means you can't push back on contract items that you don't particularly like. You don't have the ability to walk away from the table if you know that you need to partner in order to keep the doors open. You don't have that power in that conversation. If you're an organization that we would say is low risk or you have slight stress, meaning you're not completely stable, but you're, you're seeing the writing on the wall and you're seeing in the future that you're moving in the direction you don't want to go, you are, you are able to really evaluate the options for that. So that means if you have a department in your hospital that's showing some signs of stress, you have the full resources available to you to help that department, knowing that the rest of your organization is going to be stable. You have the resources available to perform performance improvement initiatives and really see the full benefits of those initiatives to only make your organization stronger and be able to reinvest in that asset base. If you're looking to partner, meaning if you're looking for clinical partnerships or anything up to a sole member substitution, if you're looking for a full partnership, you have full negotiating power. You will have numerous su su suitors at the table and you have leverage with potential partners to get the deal you want and you have the ability to walk away from the deal. It just creates that much more leverage in your hands when you're coming from a slight stress situation rather than a stressed or de-stressed situation. So what are some factors that impact risk? How are we getting to this stressed or de-stressed situation? And how do we begin to start to mitigate some of these items? So the strategic risk profile for a lot of organizations is very dynamic. At Stradwater, we break it down into four domains, financial risk, operating risk, value risk, and market risk. And there are factors within each of these domains that really have spillover effects into others and can impact other areas. So, for example, if you have lower quality scores, so that would be in your value risk category, that's going to impact your volume or people that you're getting in the door. That's going to impact your market share in your market risk category. That's going to impact your revenue in the financial risk category. These all have spillover effects into what's going to complete the overall strategic risk profile for your organization. The key here, and I can't emphasize this enough, is it's really important to look at the cumulative effects of risk over time. So that means not just evaluating your risk on an annual basis, but understanding that longevity of the risk. Because if you look at it on an annual basis, it's going to be very incremental. It's not going to look like it's changing a ton. It's easy to say, oh, that's fine. We can move on to, next, to another more pressing item. But if you look at that cumulative effect over time, and if your board does, and your leadership does, and your medical staff does, and you're united in looking at the strategic risk profile, you can really see where you're headed. And you can see the writing on the wall before you get to that extreme distressed, dire point in time. So it's really important for your board, for your leadership and your medical staff to understand that looking at the cumulative effects of strategic risk is really important for your organization. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Jeff, who's gonna talk about quantifying and mitigating risk. Thanks, thanks so much, Claire. Um, <clears throat> before I jump into this section, I just wanted to remind folks that at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A tab and a chat tab. So if you have questions for Claire and I, that you'd like to submit, uh, you can submit them at any time and we'll try to uh, address those uh, at the end of our discussion. Um, so I think Claire's done a really nice job of outlining why strategic risk matters and why we think it's important when we work with our clients. And it really boils down to 
um, the degree to which an organization's ability to fulfill its mission and serve its community um, is, is viable and sustainable, or is it at risk? And so um, what we think is really important is educating leaders, management, boards around this, this um, framework so that folks can be more proactive and timely um, in addressing various risk factors. So this slide shares that same, those same four risk domains that Claire shared with you just a few minutes ago. And it's got a little more detail to it. Um, essentially the, the white um, text you see on the screen are really some of the tools uh, or some of the disciplines that management um, can apply to address some of these specific risk factors. Uh, depending upon the organization's risk profile. So we're not going to cover all of this today, but I'll, I'll spend a, a, just a few minutes um, talking about this. Um, one of the things that's important to remember and, and to emphasize around um, this framework and strategic risk is that risk can spill over from one category into another. These are not silos. And um, for instance, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, the, an operating risk, the question of efficiency. Um, how well do your key processes work? Well, that might extend to something like, okay, your ED, your emergency department. Um, how well are you actually uh, attending to folks that present at the ED? What is the percentage that have left without being seen or treated? Uh, what is the wait time before somebody is treated in the ED? And <clears throat> if that process and service is inefficient, you're likely to see then some spillover effects, both in terms of consumer preference and perhaps market share, but also in terms of some of the financial indicators. Because if, if uh, folks have a negative view of your emergency department, they'll seek out other options, whether that be other um, uh, emergency departments or urgent care uh, and the like. So one example there, um, looking at the financial risk quadrant in the upper left, um, we view cash flow as the absolute lifeblood for organizations. No surprise to the financial people that might be on the call. Um, and, and certainly top line revenue as an early indicator of risk. And what I mean by that, if we start looking at um, five years of trend line and operating revenue is flat or heaven forbid uh, declining, it's really difficult to sustain an organization and maintain an organization given the inherent uh, cost escalators um, of providing healthcare um, with flat top line revenue. It means that somewhere we're cutting corners. Either we're not investing in, in our asset base or we're not investing in maintaining or sustaining services, but we're making compromises somewhere. And um, oftentimes because of getting to market risk, the demographic profile or trends in market share, top line revenue isn't growing where it needs to be. So then you start looking at, okay, operationally, can we do things to rein in cost? Very legitimate approach. Um, and that then also ties in financial risk. So that's a way to give you uh, an example. Um, looking at some of the right text in the upper left-hand corner, um, we view identifying gaps in performance, that is, uh, Stradwater has a, a quantification of what we believe to be a sustainable cash flow model for uh, health systems. And the degree to which a health system is performing underneath that suggests that, okay, the organization is slowly starving itself of cash and reserves and the ability to make investments going forward. Um, for an organization that's distressed, um, looking at the cash run rate, and to what degree the liquidity available to the organization uh, is, is adequate and at what point does it run out becomes more central. So it's much more of a crisis management as opposed to kind of a strategic management question in that example. Um, I mentioned in the upper right-hand corner um, around operating risk, this question of core processes and how well they, wor they work. And I, I will share with you, Claire and I have done work with a, a distressed hospital uh, in, in the Southern US recently. And when you looked at some of their core processes, both how they were able to operate their emergency department, time to be treated, 
uh, percentage of folks that left without being seen, um, also their revenue cycle. And in looking at that, there were so many different steps along uh, in, in revenue cycle that were broken. Perhaps one of the most glaring examples was um, they had been reducing uh, cost and eliminating staffing so that when somebody showed up for a routine imaging um, appointment or lab or what have you, an outpatient appointment, it was taking several hours um, more than several hours to register those folks and get folks through registration, even though the organization was not busy uh, to, to speak of. So important things to note. Um, as we look at market risk, what I would note is market share is a very much of a lagging indicator. Looking at longer term trend lines can be really helpful. It takes time to turn around market share. Just as Claire mentioned, it takes time to improve operations. So really looking at that trend line historically and, and, and understanding it by service line, by geographic submarket, um, allows you to potentially start thinking about where could you invest strategically to change those trends. New services, new providers, maybe a new clinic located in a, in a submarket. Having a distributed ambulatory um, network is, is really important, especially if you are in a competitive, a competitive market. Um, perhaps the least understood uh, segment of the, the risk vectors is around value. And really, at a, fundamentally, we're talking about the intersection of cost and quality. Uh, what are your quality scores? So making sure that you're doing well on, on those metrics, um, but also what is your cost position? Um, is it in line with where the market is? Uh, are you pricing things in a defensible uh, manner? One of our colleagues, Amy Graham, um, uh, spends a lot of time helping organizations with um, their tra uh, transparent pricing um, which is a requirement that, that the feds have put in place and making sure that those pricing uh, price points are, are defensible. I would say it, in addition on the value risk, uh, how does your aligned primary care base perform um, in, in terms of quality? Um, and are you um, either with uh, partners, ACO or other partners, um, or on your own, able to manage some of the risk and th that you may be facing in some of these advanced payment models. One of the ways to develop your capabilities in that space is to do some of the um, risk management um, of your own self-insured population um, to get that experience of looking at chronic conditions and making sure that um, you've got the right protocols and and approaches in, in place to manage those risks and manage those costs. So the white lettering really is meant to provide you with maybe a, a checklist, if you will, from management's perspective as to what are some different um, uh, initiatives that can be undertaken to manage or mitigate um, the various risks that are, that are illuminated here. So one of the things we, we often see is that an organization has additional risk beyond um, uh, what we would expect from financial or operational or market or value, in that there's some additional risk um, presented by uh, distrust or dysfunction within key stakeholders of, of, of the organization. Sometimes this can be amplified and exacerbated by a complex um, governance structure. We often find, especially in rural, um, that there may be a, a 501c3 hospital board or health system board that leases the facilities and is in charge of operating the health system. But you have either a health district board or a county board that owns the facilities. And it's not uncommon, especially if the organization is having some, some financial challenges or operational challenges, for those two boards to um, develop mistrust or dysfunction between them. Um, and so what we would suggest is um, that you begin with stakeholder education and try to develop uh, a shared understanding of what's going on and what's driving some of these challenges. Um, looking at national, regional, and market forces, um, looking at um, the, the local dynamics and constraints, and making sure that folks are developing at least some reasonable communication. We'll talk about that in just a minute. 
one of the things we strive to do when we're involved with educating various stakeholders is really develop a common fact base because it's really hard to engage in a fruitful conversation if uh, all the parties are coming to the table with a different set of facts, uh, some of which contradict each other, some of which speak to completely different issues. And it's really important to have a comprehensive um, uh, fact base that has the right context that people can trust and, and then work through uh, to develop that hopefully common understanding uh, of risk factors and objectives. Um, one of the ways to lower the temperature once you've done the education, once you've developed the common fact base, is to have a task force of stakeholders. And that may be from, if, if, if the situation happens to be more than one board, from both boards, but it could also be hospital management, um, certainly members of the provider community, medical staff, but also maybe community leaders that are seen as maybe being less vested in the history of, of any disagreements and more vested in finding solutions to benefit the community as kind of a catalyst for moving beyond that. The other really critical catalyst, and it almost sounds like common sense, but it's interesting how often folks don't get to this point, is developing a shared vision for the future. That allows folks to kind of let go of some of the baggage and, and the history and really focus on what they can do working together. Uh, so when we think about risk that, that is brought into a situation on top of those factors we talked about previously, but I, I almost call it the risk of dysfunction or the risk of distrust, um, this is a really important um, rallying point for the organization and the community and allows, allows you to engage those stakeholders around that shared vision. You know, on a more pragmatic approach, you, you can never... Um, underthink and undercommunicate when you're in a situation like that, where there is a high level of distrust, maybe there's conflict that's spilled into the public uh, sphere, and really thinking through a well thought out uh, communication strategy um, so that you can keep stakeholders informed and make sure that they feel like, okay, I know they're working on the important issues for the community and I, I trust them to do their work. Um, Lastly, and this is really why this is a risk factor, um, and we see it all too often, when organizations have an elevated level of distrust or dysfunction, um, um, what happens is folks lose sight of the fundamentals. It becomes very distracting and very time consuming and, and really a, um, a sponge for energy and effort is not losing sight of the fundamentals. So making sure that we, we establish or reestablish sound governance uh, and management tools, that we have a strategy that people are invested in and that we're focusing on operational uh, performance. As Claire talked about, without operational performance, your strategic options become greatly constrained and the organization's overall risk profile becomes elevated very quickly. So those two things in concert is a really challenging uh, dynamic for an organization. So. For those of you that are in communities, maybe you don't have uh, a level of distrust or conflict between the different boards, and that's great. What I would say is if you don't have that, it's still important to keep these approaches, these tools in mind as you work through a really challenging uh, environment for healthcare. Um, and I would argue that if, if you don't have a challenge now, it's not too early to start putting in place some of these best practices to avoid problems in the future. Obviously, if you do have that level of public conflict or distrust, um, putting um, these uh, tools in place can really be uh, valuable and helpful. So just briefly, you know, one of the things that we sometimes see is um, organizations that delay decision-making. Claire has done a nice job of outlining, you know, the, the risks imposed by delay. Um, and so certainly we're, we would never encourage a board to embark upon a strategic direction, whether it's performance improvement, radical performance improvement in the case of some organizations, or pursuing strategic options and exploring partnering without really looking at um, a common fact base and deliberating on the, the pros and cons. One thing I would emphasize here, 
there is no risk-free option, okay? So whether that's a standalone independent strategy, you're gonna have operating risk, some level of operating risk. And what you wanna do is mitigate that via performance improvement and a sound strategy and creating that alignment within the community and within the organization. So you don't have conflict or dysfunction or folks operating at cross purposes. If partnering becomes an option you wanna explore um, because of circumstances, then you wanna make sure that you select an aligned partner you select the right structure to address your constraints and strategy. And thirdly, that you negotiate terms that address your constraints and objectives and that are contractually enforceable. And as Claire articulated, um, if you are operating with distressed or even stressed operating results, your ability to achieve any of those three things is compromised. You're not gonna have a lot of choices in terms of your partner. You're not gonna have a lot of leverage in terms of talking about what structure you want. And you're not gonna have a lot of leverage in terms of getting the terms you want. So all of this kind of intersects. There's operating risk and partner risk. Both are inherent. The goal from our perspective in undertaking a strategic risk analysis is to enable management and the board to mitigate those risks and do so proactively. That's the real value proposition here. The other thing I would say, and I can't emphasize it enough, um, one of the most common regrets we hear um, when we work with a, an organization is, I wish we'd had this discussion a year ago or two years ago. Um, and that sense that time is not a neutral factor and that we've wasted too much time trying to get to unanimity as opposed to an informed consensus. Now, I will say we've been uniquely um, fortunate or lucky or, or skilled in that the organizations we work with, we often get to a unanimous uh, view as to where the organization should go and what their strategy should be. But waiting for that before you start the journey is um, really wasting time and oftentimes burning through reserves uh, and resources and allowing competitors to uh, move. So a real, a real risk factor there. So bottom line, um, we have a dynamic and risky environment. Um, and our advice, because so many of the factors we look at and so much of the information we look at is backwards looking. It's financial results. It's operating results. It's what happened with market share, which often has at least a year lag that it's really important to do this on a, on a somewhat regular basis. We would argue certainly no less than every other year um, and probably annually, at least looking at how and updating um, the, these core parts of the common fact base. So you have an idea of how the organization's trend line is, is changing. Um, making sure that the board and management has an appreciation for the long-term risk trend and how it's changing is critical. Um, looking at financial operational value in market domains, looking across those domains, and also frankly, understanding what is the level of conflict or distrust or dysfunction, either between multiple boards or within different aspects of the organization, that will elevate the overall risk profile as well. Um, and so um, making sure that you use some of those best processes and steps to, I guess I would say, um, uh, deconflict the situation and try to build trust, enhance communication, uh, and, and get that consensus and buy-in around shared vision for the future is really critical. Those two things work hand in hand. There's the hard work and the nuts and bolts of, of mitigating risk and then there's the hard work and nuts and bolts of mitigating risk associated with conflict, distrust, or dysfunction if it exists, or making sure that you're doing the hard work that that doesn't enter the equation for your organization. Um, we pride ourselves on being agnostic about our recommendations. Um, and I think that's a, a critical thing when you, if you bring in an advisor. Uh, and lastly, um, I think sound advice is not letting. Um, the perfect be the enemy of the good. So, so that's, oh, go for it, Jeff. 
No, please, Claire, go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say that's our that's our presentation. If you can look, we have time for questions, you can use the QA function on Zoom and we'll be happy to, to answer some of your questions live. We do have um a couple of questions in the QA, Claire. Um so the first question is um one of the attendees would like to know, how do you initiate conversations with a board around this subject? Um, that's one, Claire, if you're okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take the first whack at. I would probably go back to that best practice slide where we talked about the tools um, that we use and that we, we advise our, our clients to use to um, deconflict and build consensus. And it starts with education. Um, and making sure that folks are informed and have an ability to have their questions addressed. Uh, and then I think the other fundamental um, uh, building block is that shared fact base, which we pull together from all sorts of databases that we subscribe to. Uh, our analysts build out uh, the, 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 uh, really a, a comprehensive um, fact base. We also do interviews as a part of that um, fact finding. Uh, and then add to that component kind of perspective from, from our practice um, nationally to really try to provide the board with objective, good information to inform deliberations, discussion, and decision-making. But I, that's where I would start. Completely agree. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so the second um, question that we have is, what are low-hanging fruit performance improvement initiatives? I can, Jeff, it's okay with you take a, take a yes, whack at answering please. this. <laughs> the, the long and short of it is there is no clear-cut answer. It's different for every organization. So, you know, it depends on what's going on specifically at your organization. From a very high level perspective. I know in the past we've seen 340B is a big one, your cost report's a big one, finding um, little minute things in there that are great um, and can contribute to your bottom line, and as well as some revenue cycle initiatives. Those are three that typically have some inherent value in them on a pretty common basis based on our work and experience. Um, but again, you could have really low hanging fruit that's in other areas and it just depends who you are as an organization. Thank you, Claire and Jeff. Um, Thank you. That looks Great. like what we have for, um, oh, one more. Nope, that's the same okay. one. Um, so I think we're all set for questions. If, um, if anyone else has a question or a comment, please uh, take a minute to jump in. Um, but if not, then I'll let Claire and Jeff wrap up. Great. I, I just, um, while we're wrapping up, wanted to share this slide with everybody, and, and you will be getting a copy of the slides as well as a recording of the presentation. This provides an overview of our services. Um, many of you heard the introduction. We have actually, it's now, I think, a 38-year track record um, working with rural um, across a, a pretty wide array of operational and strategic um, areas. And, and the one thing I think that Claire uh, emphasized in the response to the prior question is, you know, every situation is unique. And, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves on working with clients to address their specific issues uh, where appropriate. We also pride ourselves on, on being a sounding board and a resource just to provide advice and and counsel, even if, even if we're not your advisor. Um, so uh, please, um, we're, we're, we are here to help and we are passionate about helping rural health systems. Um, with that, I wanted to um, thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, really important, we want your feedback. There's a very brief survey that we're asking folks to complete so that uh, we can continue to improve our virtual CA conference, but also, uh, be aware of what are the key issues that that you're grappling with that that maybe we didn't address uh, today or or tomorrow um, uh, in the conference. And so any information you can provide is helpful. Any feedback you can provide is helpful. And we really appreciate your time and interest. So thank you. I uh, hope everybody has a great rest of their day. Hey, Jeff. Yes. 
We did. Um, if you guys don't mind, get one more question. Sure. Um, I think we have another minute. So uh, Teresa would like to know, would you consider documentation improvement and um, UR practices to be part of the revenue cycle? Absolutely, um, documentation essential. Um, so looking at patient records, uh, looking at processes, you know, um, the, the patient registration process, you know, getting, getting things right from the start, um, but also documenting and coding. Um, so so a a absolutely essential. Um, I'm not a, um, a revenue cycle expert. We, we have those internally um, who I think would speak to the whole uh, array of rev cycle, but the, you know, the challenge with rev cycle is um, any one of those processes can derail you. And, you know, the tail end being, um, you know, denials management on the, on the back end, the front end being, um, you know, registration. And even before then making sure that you've, you've got the trained staff and the processes set up and then every point in between. And the challenge is, is if any one of those points is a weak link, it, it then has spillover effects as, as I guess, as many folks on the call know. But I, the caveat is uh, with my answer that I'm not a revenue cycle uh, expert, but I, I would agree that um, documentation is absolutely essential. And, and one of the things to do is, or that somebody can do if they have concerns, is to do a um, kind of a, an audit, if you will, of some patient records to look at and make sure that the coding was appropriate. You know, a, a small number of outpatient records and a small number of inpatient records is a way to um, make sure that the documentation um, and, and those processes are sound. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and I will let everyone go. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.